Hi Hawk, it's Miss Story here. Uh, last week we went on a field trip to the Berea Pinnacles. We hiked to the top with Coach Hunley and I talked to you about some perspective, three point perspective at the top. This week I'm in Berea still. I'm with a local potter, one of my good friends, David Inge. Um, he's going to be showing you how to do some pottery on the wheel, something that I am really uneducated at, so I'm going to be observing him. Um, I might hop it in and out of the frame to zoom in on what he's doing, but uh, at this point, I'm just going to let the master take it away. Hey guys, welcome to Tater Knob. You're on my front porch of my wonderful studio out in Red Lick on a nice quiet morning with Miss Story who I've known for a long time and you're going to have to bear with me because I did some exercising last night. <laughs> this part of the world we're living in, it's good to get outside and do something active when we're all stuck inside every day. want to make sure you get your heart rate going and my heart rate's about to get going because what I'm doing here is called throwing. And it looks as if I'm just setting my hands on that wheel and it's magic and it just instantly goes into the center. But if I knock this out and it's wibbling and wobbling around there and I just set my hands on there, it doesn't do a lot. It'll just wobble and wibble all day long. So with my body, I've turned my whole form into a tool. My knees are right together in the middle my elbows right in my hip and as my arm comes down out of my hip there and with the force from my knees to my hip to my arm when I put a solid pressure there it's gonna help put it in the center to show it one-handed one hands gonna push it down and try to make a plate and this other hand is gonna be pushing at the same time pushing up and when you do those two opposing forces together one hand pushing down one hand pushing up and you work that clay up and down right in the center of the wheel puts it in the middle it's called centering just this step alone is extremely hard to figure out it's like learning how to play the piano so once your ball of clay is right in the middle of the wheel it's centered we're gonna go right down to the bottom and we're going to leave just a little bit of clay down there. We're not talking an inch, a half inch, even a centimeter. We're leaving millimeters of clay on the bottom of that vessel. Just enough so your cereal bowl will be able to hold the milk and it'll have a bottom. If I leave it really heavy and thick, when you go to pick up your coffee mug or your juice glass, it'll, oh, and it'll be heavy. Because clay is not mud and it is not dirt I've told you that before I was wrong David's gonna explain the difference so a lot of people come in and think oh you're in here playing in the mud <laughs> you're getting dirty all day and I say yeah I love getting dirty but I'm not playing with mud and I'm not playing with dirt I'm playing with clay and clay is ground up rock from millions and millions and millions of years ago. So our glaciers came down and they dug out our Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are in Michigan, the north. So as those glaciers came down over millennia and dug and dug and dug into the ground and scooped up different types of rock, skyscraper tall glaciers crushed those rocks and that makes sand. Just like when you go to the beach and you put your toes in the sand. So if you take that sand and you melt it at 2,100 degrees, it makes glass. Just like what your windows are used for in your house. So, if that sand sits underground for millions of years, it turns to clay. So if I leave the bottom of that juice glass really thick, and I take it through my heat temperature to 2,185 degrees, it turns it back into a rock. So if I leave any of this vessel thick, when you go to pick it up, it's gonna be heavy like a rock. So I have to very elegantly get all this clay moved around through the whole vessel 
so that it's the same thickness from top to bottom. It's the same thickness at the very base of this cylinder as it is all the way up here in the rim. So, while we've been talking, I threw a cylinder. This is your basic form that if you came to me and you said, David, I'm a potter, I kind of, I know how to make some pottery and boy, I'd really like to be a potter like you. I said, well, you make me a cylinder. My mom was trained to make 50 of these in a day. All the same height, same shape, same weight. I'll go back down to the bottom, I'll grab that clay, and I'm just going to smooth it out. This helps for when I go to glaze it, for my glaze not to be taken away from anything underneath, distracting of texture. It lets my glaze smoothly run down the vessel. So. When you came out and you said, boy, I'd really like to be a potter. I'd say, let's see some cylinders and I'd have you make 12 cylinders that all look the same. And when you were done with them, I'd come and I'd cut them right in half. To show you, but it's the same thickness from top to bottom all the way from here millimeters thin through the corner all the way up is the same thickness big thing that goes along with the way that we're living right now if you make a mistake you happens in life you might have fell off the curb you might have accidentally hit little brother with something it's okay you can take that right there and knead it up and start all over again. And you can too. All you got to do is learn from that mistake that you made so that you won't do it again. The only way you learn in life is via making mistakes. Sure. So, now that we've got a little base ground covered, we're going to move into some technicalities of ceramics. It looks like I'm just sitting out here playing in clay, getting to have fun making art. It is fun. It is fun. But what I do is called production work. Yeah. I'm a production potter. I make high-end, non-functional work that costs lots of money. But what I make a living doing is making vessels that you can eat and drink out of on the everyday that are 100% safe for you to put food and drink in. Juice glasses, coffee mugs, cereal bowls, cooking ware. And to do all that, and be able to sell it at an affordable price, I have to do it pretty quickly. I make 25,000 pots a year. Wow. So, as we're throwing this one, we're going to talk about finishing. Because it's fun to sit out here and make pottery. And when I make pottery, I'm just making a couple pieces for you guys. Usually when I sit down, I throw 50 to 100 items at a time. But if I throw one day, they don't just magically turn into fired work and it ends up on the shelf beautiful. I have to finish every single one of those 25,000 pieces by hand. This was your math class part of the day. If I have to touch 25,000 pots 50 times a piece, so if each one gets touched 50 times, how many different times have I touched a pot all year long? 25,000 times 50. You know that I'm not, I'm not the greatest at math. <laughs> We've talked about that before. I'm an artist. <laughs> so, that's a lot of finishing. That's a lot. As much as it looks like I just get to sit out here and play in the clay and have fun, I have to let this work go from freshly thrown to where if I let this sit outside in the sun for two to three hours, it'll get a point called leather hard. Right now this clay is so slick and smooth and soft that if I just look at it wrong, it'll fall down. In two or three hours at leather hard, it will be very similar to leather. I'll be able to hold this bowl up on its side and it not squish. So at that point, 
That's where I put handles on my mugs and pitchers. That's where this bowl will get flipped upside down and get a foot trimmed on it to where it's a serving bowl. That's where my dinnerware plates will get flipped upside down and trimmed. That's where I make my face jugs, my rose jugs. If I need to cut a hole, if I want to put on decor, I do it at leather hard. Do you sign it at leather hard? Nope. All right. We let that leather hard work after it's had any alterations that need to be made dry completely. No moisture in the clay. If you try to fire a pot with moisture in it, it explodes and ruins your whole kiln. So we're going to go from freshly thrown to bone dry. It turns gray and is very fragile. So bone dry, no moisture. We take that bone dry work and we wait until we have a whole kill full. The kill is like a big oven. It's fired with electricity. It's got elements that get red hot and in the first firing with pots touching because I said I'm a production potter, I don't just make one bowl until that kiln's completely full. And when it's completely full, we fire it to 1,800 degrees where it turns this work into bisqueware. It's been heated to 1,800 degrees and it turns it into a sandstone-like material. That's a porous rock. If I were to put water in this, it would pass through it throughout the day. It would slowly seep out. And then we dunk it down in a glaze. A glaze is what you think is called paint. You don't go to Walmart and buy glaze. Glaze is a liquefied glass. It's glass that's suspended in water. So that glaze would just be a clear glass except that we add natural materials from the ground into it that make color. Cobalt, rutile, red iron. If you think you don't need to pay attention in science class, you do. I've told them before, art goes with math, it goes with science, it goes with social studies, it can help you in all other subjects. You can always connect it. So. At Tabor Knob, we've got six glazes, six different colors that would just be a clear glass, except we add different colorings into each different one to where we can have six different colors for you to choose from. After that vessel's been dipped down into the glaze, it looks like this. That's four different glazes put on top of each other. Looks like it's been dipped in chalk. So, after it's been dunked down in glaze, we fire it a second time to 2,185 degrees. The pots cannot touch in the second firing. They can be a piece of computer paper apart. So close that you think they're touching because as soon as that kiln starts to fire, it's going to shrink. Everything that I've made today, if it were to go through the firing process, would shrink 17%, 360 degrees round. And shrink 17% and vitrifies, which means turns back into a glass-like material. When you come buy a pie plate from me to cook a casserole in, you cannot see through the bottom of it. But it is the same thing as glass. Miss Story, why don't you go get me a nice bowl from in here, a nice big bowl. All right. It'll work. So, when we fire this to that temperature, as much as you cannot see through it, and you can't look through it, that's the same thing as glass, just not see-through. So, when that work has been fired to that temperature and it's back to a glass, a lot of people always go, what's your favorite thing about what you do? That bowl right there will be on the face of this earth for millions of years as long as a natural form of erosion doesn't come across it. I won't say millions, we'll say thousands. The oldest known artifacts that we can date time to 
are ceramics. And those ceramics are very rudimentarily done. The technological world we live in has allowed us to advance to where this is a quality line of work for you to eat and drink out of. Just ending on a nice tall form so that you can see the magic of that clay growing. This is a wonderful thing to get to do every day. I'm very lucky that my parents decided to do this and gave me the opportunity to do this. You young children out there are just like this ball of clay, ready to be formed and shaped into anything that you want to shape yourself into. At your age, in elementary school, if you guys decide that you want to be a potter today, you saw this video and, you know, it just really inspired you to create art. Inspired you to do anything. You can do it. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed hanging out with me on my porch. We're just out in Red Lick. You guys are more than welcome to come see us. Alright, well, thank you so much, David. You're welcome, guys. Not a problem. All right, I will see you next week for our next art lesson, Hawks. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. See you later. Here we are in the kiln room. This is where all the pottery gets fired. These are kilns. They're like big ovens. So once the pottery is glazed, which David talked about, it gets loaded up like a puzzle in these big kilns and fired at very high temperatures to make them safe for you to eat out of handle, microwave, dishwash even. The kiln room is pretty cool. This is a view of the outside of the pottery studio here in Red Lick, Berea, Kentucky. Absolutely beautiful.